as well. Um, so um, just very briefly before I speak this morning, just say um, I don't know if anyone's seen the news about what's going on in Sri Lanka at the moment. It's, it's not really front page because of everything that's going on, particularly in Ukraine. But I, we, both Billy and I, received messages this morning from some of our friends who are friends of this church in Sri Lanka. And there's a very difficult situation going on there with uh, the government have basically locked everything down put a curfew in place. There have been very difficult economic situations. There are ongoing power cuts, food shortages, all sort of things over those sorts of things over the recent months, and it's got to a head. Uh, social media has been shut down. Um, there's all, uh, lots of people arrested. So um, maybe we could um, just bear them in mind and think of uh, praying for them today. The nation from Sri Lanka, particularly our friends there in Kandy and Colombo, who've been here uh, many times for the Pioneer Conference. But uh, maybe I'll put a little bit more on Facebook so we can pray uh, in our own way for them as well. So this morning, we are continuing our series, Fruitfulness on the Frontline, and we've looked over recent weeks at a number of different M's. We've looked at modeling godly character, at making good work, ministering grace and love, being a mouthpiece for justice, molding culture. And this morning, I am going to be looking at being a messenger of the gospel. Now, we are God's ambassadors here on this planet, aren't we? That's part of our role. As God's ambassadors, we are called to do all of these things, to model godly character, to love and respect and care for people, to bring positive shape to our cultures, to um, model God's character in all that we do. And these are all really important things as we are ambassadors of Christ. But above all else, God longs for people not just to know what he's like, but to actually come to know him. So that now in this life and for eternity, the people he's created, the people he's loved, he loves, which is every single person who is being created and born on this planet, could be with him now and forever. Because he loves every single one of us, and everyone out there with all of his being. And uh, we know how important it is to him because, as we know, he gave up everything to make it possible that people could know him. So we've heard, um, you may remember in the Bible, Jesus shares a parable about a man who finds some buried treasure in a field, and then he then goes away, he covers up the treasure again, then he goes away, He sells everything that he has so that he can buy the field and come back to uncover and have the treasure. Now, Jesus was talking and using that as an illustration of the kingdom of heaven. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure, and we are those, when we discover it, it is so wonderful and brilliant that we want to give up everything in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven. But I think that he could also have been talking about himself, that actually he could have been that man who discovered the treasure. But the treasure is us. It's me and you and our colleagues and our neighbors and our friends and our schoolmates. That actually he so loves us, he treasures us so highly that he gave up everything so that he could have the treasure, which is the joy of living and walking with us for eternity and sharing his joy and his glory with us, which is scandalous and remarkable. And for me on so many days, it doesn't make any sense. But it is the truth at the heart of the cross. Jesus said this, John 3, 16, that famous, famous verse, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The real key in that verse is whoever believes in him. That is, those who put their trust and their faith in him will not perish, receive eternal life. But if someone has not heard about Jesus, has not understood the power of the cross and his love for them, how can they take hold of the salvation and the life that he offers? Romans chapter 10, Paul wrote this. 
But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? There comes a point where we need to open our mouths and speak about Jesus. Now, I know that for many of us, that idea, that thought can fill us with terror. If uh, I said to you, right, we're going to stop the service here and we're going to go out and evangelize. We're going to walk out on the streets and tell people about Jesus. There'll be one or two people in this room who probably jump with joy. And many of the rest of us would walk out of this building in sheer terror. Because we've often talked about evangelism or the church has talked about evangelism and we've conjured up an image of what it is. And if we're honest, we're a little bit scared of it. It's uh, someone once likened evangelism to going to the dentist. We know we're meant to go. And we know that when we get there, we're meant to open our mouth. But we are terrified and afraid that when we do, some extremely unpleasant and painful things will happen to us. In fact, some of us would rather go to the dentist than open our mouths and talk about Jesus with people who don't already know him. But maybe we're thinking about it all wrong. Peter says this in 1 Peter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. So what if God just wants us to give an answer for the hope that he's already placed in us? A hope that people have already glimpsed in us as we've modeled godly character and made good work and ministered grace and love and acted as a mouthpiece for justice and molded culture. What if everyday evangelism is simply obeying the Holy Spirit's promptings to draw alongside individuals that he already knows and he already loves and whose lives he's already walking in and working in. Knowing that God is already at work and often people have already experienced God though may not have recognized that it's him. It means we're not starting from scratch. We're actually often joining people on a journey that God is already walking on them with. Now I remember a friend of mine who I know through aviation, we were having a beer one night, not Christian, uh, I don't know whether he would probably describe himself as atheist or agnostic, probably more agnostic, um, but he was telling me that he owns a speedboat and in the summer he quite often loves to just go out on his speedboat in the night um, perhaps over to cows or on his way back from cows, he'll just stop in the middle of the Solent, turn the engine off and just sit and look at the stars. And he was telling me that actually he found it a deeply moving experience. Um, and I just felt in that moment to simply suggest, say, look, maybe what you're experiencing in that moment is actually something of God, something of God's presence. And I encouraged him that next time he did it, he said, I said, why not simply ask God the question, God, if you're real, would you show yourself to me? Now, I don't know if he took me up on the idea. He was certainly receptive to it while we're having the beer and open to it. But I sensed that God was doing something in him already. And I simply spoke into what I thought and sensed he was already doing. I believe God was already at work there. And for me, it was just to help nudge and prompt. And when we're talking about Jesus uh, with other people, we can be confident that God actually wants people to know him. We can be confident that the Holy Spirit is already at work. The Holy Spirit is the, the lead evangelist. It does not us. And we can also be confident that he does have a role for us to play. And it may only be a very small one. Sometimes we are just planting a seed that we may never see grow. Sometimes we're watering a seed that someone has already planted. And sometimes we get the joy of seeing the flower burst out of the ground as someone with us gives their lives to Jesus. But we can never be sure what part it is that we're playing, but God asks us to play it regardless. Now, some people and some environments can be downright hostile. 
to the gospel. Some can be indifferent and some can be very open and positive. But when seeds are, grow, are, are sown in any of those environments, we don't know which ones are going to grow to life. I have a friend um, who used to be in the Merchant Navy. And I remember him telling me, um, he wasn't a Christian, I remember him telling me that he was on shore leave on one particular occasion in another foreign country, and uh, as I understand sailors often do, being cooped up on ship for a while, they go and have a big night out. And he was having a big night out. He'd had a skinful, um, and he was uh, having a good time. And then up to him on the street comes a Christian who decides in that moment they are going to share the gospel with him, do some street evangelism. My friend tells me that he was not pleased He gave this guy huge amounts of abuse, told him exactly where to take his good news, and he told me that he believed that that guy probably never shared the gospel with anyone else again because he gave him such a terrible time. But what that man who'd gone out, shared the gospel, got abuse, and went away with his tail between his legs didn't know is that for my friend, as he got back on his ship, And over the coming weeks and months, he could not put out of his mind what that man had told him. He could not forget it. And within a year, he came to faith in Jesus. Hopefully, when these two meet in heaven, they'll be able to encourage one another. You see, you just never know how God is at work, but we just need to trust that he is. We don't need to be anxious. We don't need to be driven but we do need to be intentional. Jesus was very, very clear about that. His final instructions, his final instructions to his followers uh, were these. Uh, they were given to the, the disciples, and they've been given to us. Matthew 28, the famous Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus wants us to be intentional about making disciples. By making disciples, I mean sharing the good news with people, leading them to faith, and teaching them to follow him. And the promise is that as we do, God will be with us. So how can we play our part in making disciples in the diverse context in which God has placed each and every one of us? Well, there are four intentional steps that we can take. We can pray for a particular person, We can care for them, we can share truth with them, and we can offer them paths forwards. Just going to unpack those four things over the next few minutes. So firstly, pray. Now, God may already have put someone on your heart that you feel called to pray for on a regular basis. Someone who doesn't yet uh, confess to be a Christian or walk with Jesus. Um, And you may be praying for them already, but you may not. You may not have anyone in particular. So can I encourage you, each one of us, to just ask God to show us someone that he wants us to pray for. Maybe two people. Um, And we may be surprised who he highlights. It may be that like really mean girl at college or that really irritating colleague. Or maybe it will be the wonderful, easy to talk to neighbor. But then let's commit to pray for them regularly. And maybe ask others to pray in our connect groups or others in our family or our friends to pray for those individuals. Pray for their health. Pray for their well-being, for their prosperity. Pray for their relationships. Ask God to give you a genuine heart of love for them, regardless of whether they ever become a Christian. Or pray the prayer of faith. Loving them regardless. And pray for them, for opportunities for them to glimpse God's love. And pray as well that they would come to know him. And as we pray, God changes things. Prayer makes a difference. Sometimes takes a long time, sometimes happens quickly. God changes things as we pray, but often as we pray, God also changes us. So often as we start to pray for people, God gives us a passion and a compassion for them that we just can't conjure up on our own. So why not ask God to show you two people that you can pray for regularly. And if you don't see anything happen at first, 
keep praying. My friend uh, Roger, I've spoken about before. I met him in 1988. I prayed for him to come to faith on and off. I can't say I did it every day, but I did it on and off over uh, more than 20 years. In 2013, I had the absolute joy and privilege of leading him to faith just three weeks before he died. Keep going and keep praying. So caring. As we pray, let's ask God for opportunities to minister his love and his grace to the person or the people that we're praying for. And as we do, ask that God will build a genuine and open and a real and honest relationship between you and that person, a real place of safety and trust, something that will be a mutual blessing to both you and to them. And there are so many ways, aren't there, that as a church we demonstrate love and care to one another. For example, if someone has a baby or someone is sick in hospital, we put together a meal road. You can be fed for months in this church um, in those circumstances, situations. You know, we offer a listening ear over tea or coffee. We will help out with childcare and uh, support with hospital appointments. That's just what we do as part of the church community. But where we can, why not extend that love and care and compassion beyond our church community to those we're praying for? Uh, I, when I worked uh, for a flying school, had a colleague whose wife broke her foot and was immobile for uh, a month or two. And it was a real challenge because he worked very, very long hours. She looked after their son and, uh, and looked after the house and sorted everything else out at home. And for him, it was a real challenge and difficult time. She couldn't move. She couldn't uh, drive. She couldn't take their son to school. She couldn't cook or clean or any of those things. Um, that she took the primary role in, in their relationship. And uh, it was adding stress. And I thought, well, what what could I do to help? And I didn't know enough people um, who knew them to perhaps put a meal rotor together. So I decided one day, I thought, well, what do we do in church? We would just cook a meal, wouldn't we? So I, one day, felt a bit awkward and embarrassed about it because it's kind of not always what you do with your non-Christian mates. I cooked them a meal and took it around. It was a very small thing, didn't cost me a lot. I felt a bit awkward about it, but it really blessed them. And it actually opened up opportunity later on, um, a few months later for the wife to actually, I was able to bring the wife to come and receive some healing prayer with Caroline um, over some deep sort of seated um, grief issues that she'd experienced in the past. It just opened up a door to share a little bit more. I wasn't blessing them with a meal to try and get somewhere else. I just wanted to bless them with a meal, but it did bless them. Then number three, sharing truth. Genuine, no-strings-attached relationship often creates opportunities for us to share truth. Not in a preachy way, no one wants to be preached at, but in a genuine, open, and honest way. Remember, a genuine relationship is a two-way thing. It's important that we listen as much as we share, but as we listen, often we uh, earn the opportunity and the willingness of others to actually listen and hear what we have to say as well. Uh, what can that look like? That can offer, look like offering a biblical perspective on something that we're talking about. As you chat, we chat about the news, what's going on in Ukraine or Sri Lanka or something we watched on TV or the football, just to share something about how we see things and why, just as anyone would in a conversation. It can uh, look like telling your story about the difference that God has made in your life and it can involve explaining the good news finding a helpful way to communicate who jesus is why he died and what the cross is all about again i found myself um, with some friends in the lake district uh, back in october it was a friend's birthday he's a christian uh, goes to another church and he invited a few of us eight of us three of us christians five of us not and he took us off to lake district and we climbed mountains and we got very wet and we drank some really good wine and that sort of thing and i was just out for a walk we were all out for a walk and it was really really wet that day getting absolutely drenched and one of the guys i was walking with just started to talk as you do about uh, this guy wasn't a christian just started to talk about some of the challenges he and his wife had had um before they had their first child around pregnancy and those sorts of things. And it was just completely normal for me to then be chatting about some of my experiences around that sort of thing, the miscarriages we've had. And as part of that, it was natural and normal for me to share about my experience of God in the middle of that. That though it was a very challenging time, we experienced God in a very powerful way. Um, And he was really interested, as people are. I was just sharing a bit of my life and my journey with Jesus. Um, Sometimes we can hold back 
from sharing fully who we are, especially the God parts, the bits that we would very easily share with one another, perhaps because we feel that people might be uncomfortable with what they're sharing or think we're a little bit odd. But I have to say, in my experience, I've been surprised how interested people are to hear about my story and how interested they will be to hear about your story if it's genuine and honest and real. But, as with the evangelism bit, it's all very well, isn't it, to share something of our story. But when it comes to explaining the good news, it can actually feel daunting, can't it? Especially to do it in a meaningful way without any Christian jargon. To explain who Jesus is, what the cross is about, what it means to put our faith in it. And we can worry, can't we, that we will get it wrong. We've heard it given so many times from people who seem to be able to do it so well, perhaps at the front of church or in a meeting, and we're worried we might get it wrong, it might not make sense. And sometimes, if we're honest, or maybe it's just me, we can put ourselves under huge pressure. The opportunity comes with a friend to actually share the good news, explain the gospel, what it's all about. And we can feel that it's the only opportunity they may ever have to hear the gospel. And if we get it wrong, or if we confuse them, and they don't immediately get down on their knees and ask what they must do to be saved, then we have blown it for eternity, and they're never going to get saved. We've lost the one opportunity. Oh dear, woe is me. We can put that expectation and pressure on ourselves, can't we? But we need to take that off and trust that God loves them, he is at work in them, he will use us, and he will give them other opportunities, even if we don't get it quite right. That each opportunity is a seed sown and a glimpse that they get of the good news. But we not only need to take the pressure off ourselves, but we can also help ourselves if we think through in advance how to share the gospel clearly and succinctly. Because then it takes some of the pressure off us when the opportunity arises. Does anyone here, it's going back quite a few years, more than 20 years, anyone remember the TM challenge? Put your hands up if you remember the TM challenge. It was either the three minute challenge or some people termed it the Tony Morton challenge. Because it was this idea that we were encouraged as a church to think about how we could tell the story of the cross and a little bit about our experience and our testimony in just three minutes in a clear and succinct way. And we all had to think about it and we all had to practice and try it. We haven't done it for a long time. But actually, why not have a think about how you could just explain Jesus and the cross and salvation in less than three minutes in a clear way, in a succinct way? And why not try it out? on with your friends or your family, uh, Chris Tuff or the Christian ones, if you like, in your connect group, in your pattern group, and just see. Because actually, you might be surprised that when you're a bit more prepared, the opportunities that actually arise to share in that way. Also, what you could do is take a look at uh, this on the slide, the three circles. It may... There we go. Has anyone seen the three circles before? I'm not going to explain it now because it will take three minutes. Um, We haven't got three minutes. But if you go online and look up the three circles, it's a really good visual way, easy, non-jargony way of just explaining the whole process of, you know, well, who's Jesus? What's he all about? And what difference can he make to me? So look that up online, three circles. So finally, offering paths forward. When you ask a group of Christians how they came to faith, you will quite often find that there was something that drew them through reading the Bible, through reading the Word for many people, and also for others, being around Christians. And for many people, it's a bit of a mixture of the two. So therefore, if we can introduce people who are interested in faith, who are wanting to explore a little bit more, if we can introduce them to the Bible or to other Christians, or to a combination of both, we can help them find a way forward of moving towards Jesus and discovering more. That could look like inviting someone to do a discovery Bible study um, with them over coffee at Costa, for example. If you've never done a discovery Bible study, they're really easy and actually quite good fun. You could invite someone along to Alpha 
you could include them in a social activity with a few friends, just as my friend did inviting a few of us up to the Lake District. Um, or you could invite them along to church. There are certain times when it's easier to invite people to church. You know, Christmas is a great time. Easter is a good time. People know a little bit more about that. But why not invite them along to church on a Sunday as well? So just a few thoughts there about how we can be intentional about sharing the good news with Jesus. But before I finish, I'd like to invite Alec uh, to come down and, uh, and I want to find out a little bit from him about what this means in his life. Good morning, Alec. Good morning. Good morning. So, Alec, um, first of all, could you tell us what it is you do and what your front line looks like? Okay. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, University of Southampton. I try to make jet engines quieter. So that's, that's my job, if you like. Uh, and my front line is partly there. So I, I have um, all my colleagues, of course, uh, the students. Um, uh, but also, I have a front line at home. Uh, Lizzie and I run an Airbnb, and we have lots of guests coming and staying with us for two or three days. Um, and then, of course, there's also family and neighbors. And so within that context, what does being a messenger of the gospel look like to you just on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well, that's a good question. <laughs> you told me what the question would be. Um, hmm, that's what I think. Uh, it's, um, uh, first of all, I have to say I'm not by nature an outgoing person particularly. Uh, I am in a way. I'm quite happy talking in front of a crowd. Um, but I'm not a sort of party animal. I'm a slow thinker. Um, deep thinker, um, but I'm not a fast thinker. So standing on a street corner and having people come by when you've got three minutes to share the gospel. I have, have done that. I'm not very good at that. Um, so it's not like that. Um, it's more like, uh, for me personally, what you were saying before. I've got great respect for people who can do that, but that's not me. Uh, much more relationship-based. Um, I particularly like situations where I can talk to people one-to-one, -one. Um, and the best place to do that actually is with our Airbnb guests uh, because they come and stay with us for a few days and typically we'll, we'll uh, invite them to have a meal with us for one of those days um, and then during the meal you talk, don't you? And it's an opportunity to talk uh, at whatever depth they feel comfortable with. Um, so sometimes our conversations um, wouldn't involve anything related to God or the gospel. Um, but if you're if you are walking with God and you're praying, um, I mean, most of us, well, all of us here, probably, doing our best to walk with God. And so we, we pray a lot and probably read the Bible a lot. And if you're doing that, then things just come out, don't they? <laughs> unless you stop them, unless you stop it. You were saying that you can be, a, you can be frightened. But if you're, if you're um, particularly as you get older, I think, you get more, more confident. Uh, you don't worry so much about what people will think. And it comes out, and it's little things that come out, and then it's like, it's like fishing with a hook and line instead of a net. Uh, either people nibble, or they don't. And if they don't, that's fine. I mean, our Airbnb guests, uh, we don't force them to sit through a diatribe. Um, if they're not interested, they're not interested. Um, but what we found, and I was talking this, about this in the car on the way, uh, about half of the people who stay with us actually want to know more about the gospel, want to know more about God, um, and a lot more about the Bible, um, which is a lot. I mean, it's more than you might think. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry to say it's uh, um, a bit sad. It's less the Brits. Uh, the people from overseas tend to be uh, more interested um, than the Brits, which is a bit of a shame, isn't it? And we, I talked just about offering paths forward and how it can be helpful to engage people with the Bible and other Christians, and you've just touched on that a little. Um, how have you seen that be effective for the people you're praying with and journeying with, that sense of introducing to other Christians and the Bible? Uh, we're very aware of that because we meet so many people who are on different stages of the journey, just like you were saying. Um, and it's great that some of them have come, um, I think I've shared before about someone who came from China uh, to our Airbnb. We said grace. We often say grace. It's a fantastic way of 
of just starting a conversation if people want to talk. Um, and uh, that particular person said, it's, it's amazing. My mother's been praying for me for 10 years that, that I would be impacted by the gospel. And she prayed for me, particularly when I came to the UK. Uh, and, and here we are. And that's, that's fantastic. Um, so someone like that, um, we invited to our connect group. So we're members of a fantastic connect group. Some people here. Fred last night was, not last night, Thursday was leading us in a fantastic Bible study. And someone like that, very ready to dive in and, and learn everything that they can. It's fantastic. Um, but not everyone's like that. Some people um, we invite on a walk, say. We try not to do too many things that cost money because not everybody can afford lots of money. Uh, but, so we often go out to the New Forest and go for a walk. And then we invite people for whom that's, uh, that's where they're at and that's appropriate. Uh, we also have in the, in the middle, as a connect group, we do a table talk, which is led by Alex Wong, who I don't think he's here today, but many of you will know from Malaysia. Um, and there we talk about topics uh, without getting too deep. Our connect group is, is pretty jolly. Well, you've been there. Have you been there? Yeah. Pretty jolly Bible-centric. Um, and a lot of people want that. But some people aren't quite ready for that, so we do something more topic-based. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Alec. And it's been so encouraging. It's great connect group. I came along on Zoom. Um, but at times you even have people who aren't yet Christians actually leading Bible studies paired up with a Christian, so they're leading and exploring the Bible and a lot of life coming out of that, which is just wonderful. That's right. so. one, one of my enduring memories from the last couple of years that we've been uh, in this connect group is of uh, somebody who wasn't a Christian uh, preaching... Uh, on the common because it was during covid so we couldn't meet in in the house and this was somebody who wasn't yet a christian preaching about daniel in the lion's den <laughs> on the common it's, it's amazing but uh but god uh god works through his word and we've seen people grow just by our bible says you've seen it very simple we read read the passage then discuss it and one of the things that we've we've found is that everybody's got something really worthwhile to share. It's not just those of us who've been Christians for many, many years. It's actually people who are new to the faith, not yet Christians. Uh, everyone's got something interesting to bring to the table. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So being a messenger of the gospel, sharing our faith with other people can feel daunting, can't it? And we can feel guilty when we don't do it, but it doesn't have to be that way. And just hearing uh, the sort of natural sense of the way that Alec and Liz uh, do that is just really encouraging to hear. It can become a natural and normal part of our life and conversations. You know, equally, it can feel a little bit demoralizing when we've uh, stepped out of the boat and perhaps shared some faith with someone and it feels like it doesn't have any impact at all. But in that context, we're also in really good company. We read the story of the Apostle Paul uh, in front of the Governor Felix, in front of Herod Agrippa. He has an opportunity to explain the gospel in great detail and amazing ways, and they walk away not that interested in it. And he's someone who was an expert in sharing the gospel and leading people to Jesus. At the end of the day, we are not called to make people become Christians. We are simply called to share the good news of Jesus. What people do with that is up to them. It's between them and God. We simply sow the seeds and allow the Holy Spirit to water them. But we do know that the more seeds we sow, the more flowers will grow. The more we share openly and honestly and lovingly about Jesus and what he's done for us, the more people will discover the wonderful, life-giving good news that we've received. And uh, the more rejoicing they'll be in heaven as someone else comes and comes to know Jesus. Jesus told us that these were the most two, the two greatest commandments. He said this, didn't he? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. When we live out the Great Commission, that is sharing the good news of Jesus and introducing people to him, we honor both of those great commandments. Because we're loving God by doing what he's commanded and by helping fulfill the desires of his heart. That his people, the people he's created, will come to know him and share in his joy 
and his glory. And we are loving our neighbor by introducing them to the one who loves them and died with them. And we make it possible for them to step into a glorious eternity with him. So I, over recent weeks, have just real sensed and urged to start praying afresh that we as a community will become increasingly confident at sharing Jesus with those around us in a natural and a normal and ordinary way. And I've started to pray that each week, every week, would God just lead one person to him through someone in this community? So maybe you could join with me as we continue to pray that just one person each week would come to faith through members of this community. We may never see them here at Central Hall, but that's okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderfully good news that has led to so many of us in this room coming to know you, coming to walk a walk of faith, to enjoy your kindness, your goodness, and your love. We know it's not always an easy path, and it's not always an easy walk. But we have so many stories of your testimony of you walking with us through the hardest of times, sustaining life, bringing joy, bringing hope. And thank you for the hope we have of eternity with you. And I simply ask, Father, Lord, that you would stir our hearts to share that good news, that joy, and that hope with those around us. Father, as we just take a moment to pause now, Lord, would you show us someone, one or two people that you want us to start praying for? And as those people have popped into our minds, Lord, would you... Just remind us as we go home and have our dinner, as we go to bed tonight, as we wake up tomorrow, just would you place them on our hearts that we would start to pray and that you would bring opportunity in time for them to hear the good news of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.